All right, hello everybody, and welcome to another module for Bio One. Where in this module we're going to be discussing genetics, uh, patterns of inheritance, and kind of the uh, you know the factors that not factors, but the important work that Gregor Mendel did um, in order to allow us to gain a better understanding of of how we inherit specific traits from our parents. Um, and so that's what this whole module is going to be about. All right. So with this first video, we're going to specifically look at kind of the history of um, the study of the patterns of inheritance um, and kind of how our understanding became increased through the work of Gregor Mendel. And throughout, you know, human history, we've we've had a really good idea of you know, the fact, or we've, we, we've had a pretty good understanding of how traits can be inherited from parent to offspring. So we knew that it's possible for this to happen. We just didn't have a really good understanding of the specific mechanisms that led to this um, pattern of, of inheritance. And, you know, people have selected and made it for preferred traits in dogs throughout, you know, the last 15,000 years or so. Um, and that's led to all the different species of dogs that we see today. And, um, you know, the, the biological principles really uh, that under, underlie genetics and actually, you know, facilitate the mechanisms that lead to these different species really only have been understood since Gregor Mendel in the late 1800s, but even then his work really didn't come to the forefront until say the early 1900s. And so we haven't really understood the, the processes that underlie these genetics for, you know, a considerable amount of time, even though we've been tinkering with genetics for thousands of years as, as a species, you know, e even the hunter, not the hunter gatherers, but the um, human populations that domesticated crops would most likely have selected for specific types of, of strains and specific yields and so like for specific traits in their crops and so uh, artificial selection what that is when humans are kind of leading those selection pressures it has really been been occurring for thousands of years and so here we have you know just one example of uh, a species of um, dog that uh you could you could see you know and this is just one of you know 100 species or so of dogs and now in order to kind of understand the mechanisms that gregor mendel brought to light we've got to uh kind of just go through some initial definitions and kind of some 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 background first um the first term we're going to look at is heredity and heredity just means that uh, traits are being transmitted from one generation to the next, so from parent to offspring. And the field of genetics basically just studies heredity. So genetics is the scientific study of the transmission of traits from, from one generation to the next or from parent to offspring. And it was Gregor Mendel who really, you know, did the work that led to kind of the understanding of of how heredity heredity actually works in organisms and he did this through experiments with pea plants and he really found out and discovered that parents pass on to their offspring specific genes and he called these genes heritable factors. So the term gene hadn't really been brought up yet. And so he just labeled these genes as, as heritable factors. Um, and so it, we now know that through his work, genes are really responsible for these inherited traits that are passed on from parent to offspring. And it's the genes that basically retain the individual identities that we see from generation to generation. Um, and that's the actual aspect of the trait that's passed on um, one generation to the next. So here we have an image of Gregor Mendel himself. So Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk. Um, 
who <clears throat> was was working in a garden in a garden and he chose to study pea plants we think um, because they're pretty easy to grow and they come in quite a different uh, quite quite a quite a lot of varieties um, and those varieties are, are very distinguishable from one another and so he could specifically go in and look at specific characters and the various traits within those characters and modify and choose which traits are bred between the pea plants and so here we're going to define what a character and a trait is because it's really important to be able to distinguish between these two. So a character is any kind of feature that varies between individuals. For example, hair color, eye color, height. So that is a character. The trait is a specific variant or specific form of that character. So hair color, you can have brown hair, blonde hair, um, red hair, all of those are traits of the character hair color. Same thing with eye color. Eye color would be your character. Specific trait of eye color would be green eyes, brown eyes, hazel eyes, blue eyes, etc. And, and so that would be your, your specific traits of those characters. And what again is really important about Mendel's work with these pea plants is that he could control the entire aspect of their reproduction. So he could go in and if you look at a pea plant, they have flowers. And here we can see the pea flower. You have your petal and then you have the male and female parts of the, of the, the pea plant on the same flower. So you have a stamen which carries the pollen and then you have a carpal which carries the eggs. Now what Mendel could do is if he wanted to go in and fertilize one plant with pollen from a different plant, he could take the pollen from a specific flower stamen and directly put it onto the carpel of another flower to ensure that that flower is being fertilized by another specific plant. So if he wanted plants with specific traits, and what that means is that he can end up creating purebred varieties of plants, and then he can cross those different purebred varieties. So here's an example of how he would do that. So he would take, say if he wanted to breed the purple with the white flowers, he would take the pollen or the stamen from the purple flower and he would clip those off so that the pollen couldn't land on the female part and self-fertilize. Once those stamens were removed, he then could take the pollen from the, the white flower stamens and directly transfer that to the carpal of the purple flower. Now his offspring are going to have the, the heritable traits that come from both the purple and the white parents. And so these are called the pure breeding generations or the P generation and the first generation of offspring that you get from that pure breeding generation is what we would call the F1 generation. Okay, And that F1 generation is referred to as hybrids. And so the hybrid individuals are the offspring of your two different purebred varieties. And so this process is known as cross fertilization and you're really performing a genetic cross between two individual pea plants or individual organisms in general. So again, the pure breeding generation, the parental plants is known as the pea generation. Their offspring is the hybrid offspring and is known as the F1 generation. And then if you cross individuals from the F1 generation, the next generation would be an F2 generation. So you have your pure breeding, your first hybrid, and then your second hybrid generation. So P generation, F1 generation, and F2 generation. Okay. And so Mill went in and he performed a lot of experiments where he 
looked at the hair inheritance of several different color or several different characters. And he made sure that his characters occurred as two alternative traits. So only two alternative traits. Um, and it allowed him to really generate a couple different hypotheses about inheritance specifically. And so here's an example of the characters that uh, Mendel looked at. So for example, he looked at flower color, which is purple and white. He looked at flower position, whether or not the flowers grew from the axial um, positions or if they grew at the end of the stem on the terminal, so the terminal position. He looked at seed color, whether they were yellow or green. He looked at their shape, whether they were round or wrinkled. He looked at the pod shape, which would be inflated or constricted. Then he looked at pod color, which could be green or yellow. And then he also looked at stem length, which could be tall or dwarf. And so he could look at each of these characters and see how they were transferred from the P generation to the F1 generation to the F2 generation to really gain an understanding of how these characters and traits are inherited from parent to offspring. Okay, so this figure here, 9.5, shows a cross between a purebred pea plant with purple flowers and a purebred pea plant with white flowers. Okay? And so basically Mendel thought that the gene for white flowers did not disappear in the F1 generation, but that it was being masked or hidden in that hybrid, that first hybrid generation. And what he also thought is that if this is the case, if that is hidden, then the hybrid plants must have two heritable factors for flower color, one for purple and one for white. Okay. And so from these hypotheses that he generated, or, or basically from these observations, he generated four specific hypotheses. Okay. And so this next slide, we're going to kind of just go over that figure and, and kind of make sure you, you understand exactly what Mendel was looking at. So he saw that with the purebred flowers, so purple flowers and white flowers, meaning purebred meaning that if you always breed purple individuals with purple individuals, you will always get purple offspring. Same thing for white flowers. If you always breed white flowers with white flowers, you get white flowers as offspring. And now what he wanted to determine was what happens when you breed a purple flower with a white flower. That's pure breeding. And what he found is that 100% of the offspring have the flower color purple. And this is where he thought, you know, that the white character or, or the white factor that um, controls white flower color was not lost, but hidden in the, the genes of these flowers or the heritable factors as he called them. And so he then took individuals from the F1 generation and bred them together. So he crossed an F1 individual with another F1 individual. And what he found in that second generation is that the white color actually shows back up. You have 75% of your offspring having purple flower color and 25% having white flower color. Okay, so three fourths purple, one fourth white. Um, and that is, is showing and, and actually giving evidence to the fact that the white heritable factor, the white allele trait, we'll talk about those in a little bit, is actually masked in that F1 generation. Okay. And so based off these observations, he came up with four different hypotheses for the inheritance of single characters. The first is that there are different versions of genes that account for the variation that we see. And these, alter these alternative versions are called alleles. Okay, so let's look at eye color. So eye color, eye color is your character. What specific color your eye is, is the trait. And each allele determines a specific trait. 
So for example, you have alleles for blue eyes, alleles for green eyes, alleles for brown eyes, alleles for hazel eyes. And so each allele determines what color your eye is going to be. Same thing for flower color. You have a purple allele and you have a white allele. And so those that variation in flower color is determined by these different alleles. The second thing that he, he hypothesized is that for each of these characters, an organism will inherit only two alleles, one from each parent. So basically, if you have traits, if you have alleles for flower color, you'll get one allele for flower color from your male parent and one allele for flower color from your female parent, equaling two total alleles for that character. And then based on your allele combinations, your character or the trait for that character will appear a certain way. And so if, if the organism has two identical alleles, say two purple alleles or two white alleles, they're said to be homozygous for that gene. So two of the same. Now, if an organism has one or has two different alleles, they're known as heterozygous. So if the organism has one purple and one white allele, then they're heterozygous for that gene. The third hypothesis that he came up with is hypothesis related to dominance. So basically, between the two alleles, there's going to be a dominant allele and a recessive allele, okay? The dominant allele will always show up as the, the, the trait if it's present. The recessive allele will only be able to show up if the organism has two recessive alleles, okay? And so generally with the way the, no, the way the notation works is geneticists will generally use uppercase letters to represent dominant alleles and lowercase letters to represent recessive alleles. Okay. And then the last hypothesis that, that Mendel came up with is that a sperm or an egg only carries one allele for each character <clears throat> because those two alleles segregate from one another during the production of the gametes, the sperm and egg. So this is that um, separation of chromosomes during meiosis, okay? And, <clears throat> and so they didn't really know about meiosis at the time, but based off of his observations, Mendel saying he believes that these two heritable factors will separate from one another when sperm or an egg is made. And this is called the law of segregation, the fact that your alleles will segregate from one another. Okay? And then they reunite when the sperm, and, or not reunite, but they unite when sperm and egg is, is um, put together during the process of fertilization. And then each sperm and each egg will give its associated allele causing the um, genetic combination to form in that offspring. Okay, so the next figure is showing that process of, of segregation, all right? So if you have an individual with purple flowers, then that means it has two <clears throat> uppercase Ps, okay? And we're going to discuss this a little bit here. If I can find my pointer. Where did my pointer go? There it is. Okay. So remember we said that your purple flowers, your parent, okay, so your parent generation is your pure breeding generation. Okay. So what that means is if you breed purple with purple, you always get purple. And if you breed white with white, you always get white, okay? And so because of that, we know that they have to have the same alleles. So they're homozygous, oops. And so what that means is, if they are homozygous, then they have to have two of the same alleles. So uppercase P and uppercase P for purple, and lowercase p and lowercase p for white, OK? 
Okay, so they're homozygous. The purple is homozygous dominant. The white is homozygous recessive. And the way we know that purple is dominant to white is that if we cross a purple flower with a white flower, because all of the offspring are purple, then, then that means that the purple is dominant to white because it's masking that white flower color, okay? So if you breed pure breeding parents, the trait that shows up in the F1 generation is the dominant trait, okay? Now, whenever we look at what alleles can be passed on from these individuals, we just have to look at their allele combinations, okay? So the only alleles that the purple flowers have are capital P's. So they will always give capital P's. The alleles that this pure breeding white flower has is lowercase p's. So they will always give a lowercase p. Now their offspring, so what that means is their offspring, I don't know why it's doing that. Their offspring will have a specific genetic ratio. And we're gonna show what that is right here. So this is called a Punnett square. We have a slide that it, that will go over this in a minute and basically what we're going to do is we're going to say all of the alleles from the purple flower will be uppercase okay so there's our purple parent these are lowercase this is our white flower parent okay now if you get one allele from purple and one from white that means you'll have an uppercase P and a lowercase P. Okay, and you'll do that for the other four common or other three combinations. And so all of them will have this uppercase P, lowercase P, so dominant and recessive alleles. So both of these are different alleles, they're not the same. So all of the offspring, all of them, will have the heterozygous genotype, okay? So now that they have the heterozygous genotype, each individual can give a, an uppercase P to a gamete or a lowercase P to a gamete, okay? Because we know that these alleles segregate from one another during uh, meiosis. So half of the alleles will have uppercase P the other half will have lowercase p, okay? Okay, so now if we know that the heterozygous individuals will give one uppercase and one lowercase, we can make our Punnett square for the F2 generation. So one parent will give an uppercase, one parent will give a lowercase, and then the other parent will give the same, an uppercase and a lowercase. Now, if we just do the crosses, so you have uppercase P, uppercase P, so that's homozygous dominant, so two of the same alleles and they're the dominant alleles. Then we have a lowercase P and an uppercase P, so that's heterozygous. And you have an uppercase P, and a lowercase p, so that's another heterozygous. And then you have a lowercase p and a lowercase p, so that's a homozygous recessive, okay? So based off of this cross, an F2 generation that comes from purebred parents will always end up with three out of four of their offspring having the dominant phenotype. And the phenotype is just the way the organism looks or the way that the, tr the trait is expressed. So in this case, the phenotype is either purple flowers or white flowers. So three of the four offspring will have purple flowers. One of the four offspring will have white flowers. The phenotypic ratio then is for every three purple flowers, you can expect one white flower. 
whenever you have a cross of your F1 hybrids, so your heterozygous hybrids, your heterozygous generation. Now that ratio is going to be different. The phenotypic ratio is going to be different from the genotypic ratio. The phenotypic ratio is the way they look. The genotypic ratio is the specific combination of alleles that they have. So if we look at our four offspring, one individual has homozygous dominant, one individual has homozygous recessive, and two individuals are heterozygous. So the genotypic ratio for these four um, possibilities is a one to two to one ratio. One homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, and one homozygous recessive, okay? So from our F1 generation that have come from pure breeding uh, parents for one character, we can expect a phenotypic ratio to be three purple to one white and a genotypic ratio to be one homozygous dominant to two heterozygous to one homozygous recessive, okay? And you can pretty much expect those ratios if the character is driven by only two alleles that are dominant and recessive. So for example, if we did a cross uh, like this and we bred 100 flowers, we would expect 75 of those flowers to be purple, 25 to be white, 25 to have the homozygous dominant genotype, 50 to have the heterozygous genotype, and 25 to have the homozygous recessive genotype. Okay, so you want to remember these ratios, the phenotypic ratio and the genotypic ratio for a monohybrid cross, and that's what this cross is. It's a monohybrid, so mono, I don't know why my text is being funny today. Okay, monohybrid cross. So a monohybrid cross is using one character and one character only. Okay, now we can get more complicated and do crosses where we look at two and three and four and five and however many characters you wanna look at, but the math and the, the way that the uh, alleles can be passed on gets extremely complicated. So the simplest way is through this monohybrid cross that we've shown here. Okay. Now, that cross that we just did, so this little square down here at the bottom that we use to figure out the ratios, that is called a Punnett square. So you have four possible combinations of gametes in that Punnett square, and the resulting four possible offspring shows up in that F2 generation. So each square, represents an equal probable product of fertilization. So basically a one in four chance. So you have a 25% chance for each square to happen, okay? And we also distinguish between the physical appearance, which is the phenotype, like I mentioned in the last slide, and then also the genetic makeup, which is the genotype. So basically the physical appearance, whether the flowers are purple or white, and the genetic makeup, whether they're homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive or heterozygous. Okay. Whenever Mendel looked at all of those seven characters that we previously went over in that table several slides ago, he studied all of those seven characters and found that they had the same exact inheritance pattern. Of the two parental traits, one disappeared in the F1 generation and reappeared in 25% or one fourth of the F2 generation. And that mechanism is explained by the law of segregation, the fact that your pairs of alleles segregate during meiosis and that the fusion of gametes at fertilization creates those allele pairs again, okay? And so that's really important for understanding how that process happens. 
And now we're going to look at another diagram where we're showing a pair of homologous chromosomes that are carrying alleles for the same genes. And these are the same homologous chromosomes that we discussed during the meiosis chapter. And remember we said that each chromosome, each homologous chromosome has multiple genes on those chromosomes and each gene has a specific locus or location on that chromosome. So if it's at the top of the chromosome, it's always going to be at the top of that chromosome and that's its locus, that's its specific location. So the genes are found at loci, which is a plural, um, and each locus can have different alleles for that gene okay, on those homologous chromosomes. And again, those, chrom those alleles can have either, uh, those two chromosomes, the homologous chromosomes, can have either identical alleles or different alleles. So they could be heterozygous or um, they can um, be homozygous. Okay, so here we have homologous chromosomes. So let's say that this is chromosome one, okay? And chromosome one has um, three different genes. We have the P gene, the A gene, and the B gene, okay? Now with this, um, with this gene, or with each of these genes, you have different alleles, okay? So this individual that has two copies of its chromosome one, so it's maternal and paternal copy, would have homozygous dominant alleles because they're uppercase and they're the same on the chromosome. For A, they would be homozygous recessive, so they're the same and they're both, they're both homozygous, I mean not recessive, so they're homozygous recessive. And then the B is um, heterozygous. It has one uppercase and one lowercase. They're different. One is dominant, one is recessive. So at the three loci that's found on these chromosomes, these two homologous chromosomes, two of them are homologous. One is heterozygous, but one is um, not homologous. Two of them are homozygous and one is heterozygous. One is homozygous dominant and one is homozygous recessive. Okay. Next, we're gonna talk about the law of independent assortment, which we already discussed in meiosis as well. So Mendel basically deduced the law of segregation by following the characters through two generations. Okay, so through his uh, monohybrid cross. Then Mendel wanted to figure out what would happen if you were following more than one character. What would happen if you were following two characters? Okay, so basically what would it look like if we were following seed color and seed shape? How would they, um, how would those alleles travel and be inherited from one generation to the next. And so we're gonna talk about that uh, over the next couple of slides. Before we do that though, let's just kind of do a little review. So the first one is if two plants have the same genotype, do they have to have the same phenotype? The second one is if two plants have the same phenotype, do they have to have the same genotype? And so take a minute and think about that. All right, so if an organism or a plant has the same genotype, then they will have to have the same phenotype because the two alleles are what's governing the phenotype. However, if they have the same phenotype, they could potentially have different genotypes. So for example, if they are purple flowers, then they could either be homozygous dominant or heterozygous because as long as there's a dominant allele, they will have that purple color. However, if you're homozygous dominant, you will always be purple regardless of, of what other factors happen. 
okay? So if you have the same genotype, you will always have the same phenotype. And if you have the same phenotype, you could have a different genotype. Okay, so now, law of independent assortment, okay? So whenever Mendel cross the F1 plants with each other in his, um, in his cross, if the genes for the two characters were inherited together, then the F1 hybrids would produce only the same two kinds of gametes that they received from their parents. The F2 generation would also have a three to one phenotypic ratio, okay? So if we're looking at two characters and they are inherited together, so if those genes are inherited together, the F1 hybrids would have the same gametes as the parents and the F2 generation would show that three to one phenotypic ratio. Okay, so this is what he would expect if they were inherited together. However, if this, the characters sorted independently from one another, so if seed color doesn't determine seed shape, then the F1 generation can produce four gamete genotypes in equal quantities. So basically each gamete genotype has a 25% chance of occurring. The F2 generation would have nine genotypes with four different phenotypes, and those phenotypes would occur in a nine to three to three to one ratio, okay? And so if the two characters independent, uh, if the two characters were inherited together, we would expect a final phenotypic ratio of three to one. If they, it were inherited independently from one another, then we would expect a phenotypic ratio of nine to three to three to one. So Mendel did these experiments and he looked at the ratios and a dihybrid cross that we're gonna look at in the next figure is basically the same thing as two monohybrid crosses occurring at the same time. And so this figure is showing what you would expect if there was dependent assortment. So if those alleles are assorted together. And so if that's the case, then you would expect um, <clears throat> the capital R and capital Y to always be together and the lowercase r and the lowercase y to always be together. If that's not the case, then you can get multiple combinations of those alleles together. And we'll look at this in more detail in a second. And so what Mendel actually saw was this independent assortment hypothesis. So he did not see this uh, dependent assortment results, okay? So basically what's happening is with these pure breeding parents, we have smooth versus wrinkled seeds, and we have yellow versus green seeds, okay? Smooth and yellow are the dominant phenotypes. Wrinkled and green are the recessive phenotypes. Okay. So your pure breeding round yellow parent was bred with your pure breeding wrinkled green parent and in both situations, they only can give a capital R and a capital Y and a lowercase r and a lowercase y. So that F1 generation is going to be the same. All of the individuals will be heterozygous for seed shape and seed color. Okay, see that? So the heterozygous capital R, lowercase r, heterozygous capital Y, lowercase y, okay? Now the difference comes when these alleles are passed from the F1 generation into the F2 generation, because here where it is here is where it differs. So again, if it was a dependent assortment, you would expect the capital letters to stay together and the lowercase letters to stay together. But that's not what we saw. 
Instead, you get an independent assortment of these alleles in your gametes, okay? So each gamete has only one copy of each letter or each, or each character, okay? So remember, each letter refers to a character. So the Rs are referring to round seeds and the Ys, or not round seeds, but seed shape, and the Ys are referring to seed color. So you need one of each in your gametes. So one combination is capital R, capital Y, which is what we see here. Another combination is lowercase r, capital Y, which is the second column. A third combination is capital R, lowercase y, which is in the third column. And then the final gamete combination is lowercase r and lowercase y, which is the fourth column. And since we're um, crossing two parents that are heterozygous for both, you get the same genotypes on the left-hand side. So capital R, capital Y, lowercase r, capital Y, capital R, lowercase y, and then lowercase, lowercase, okay? And so when you do these crosses, you just combine, and so you would have your R's, so two uppercase, then your Y's, two uppercase. So homozygous dominant R, homozygous dominant Y. For this one, you would have a recessive R and a dominant R. So it would be heterozygous at seed shape, but it has two dominant Ys. So it would be homozygous dominant for seed color. And you would continue to go through these combinations until you filled out the dihybrid cross. Now, if you go in and you count the phenotypes, you'll get a nine to three to three to one phenotypic ratio, okay? So the different phenotypes you can have are round seeds that are yellow, round seeds that are green, wrinkled seeds that are yellow, and wrinkled seeds that are green. And you would go through and count them. So your round yellow would be homos or would be dominant alleles for both. So you would have one here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, okay? Then your round green would be dominant R, at least one dominant R, and then homozygous Y. So you would have one, two, three. Your wrinkled yellow would be recessive Rs and a dominant Y. So that would be this one, which is one, two, three. And then your wrinkled green would have to be homozygous recessive for both because wrinkled and green is, are both um, recessive traits. So that would be your last one, which is uh, homozygous R, homozygous recessive R and homozygous recessive Y. So nine to three to three to one ratio, okay? This ratio is also important to remember. So this ratio shows up if you have two characters that are being crossed in parents. So a dihybrid cross, okay? So a dihybrid cross results in a phenotypic ratio of nine to three to three to one um, in a dihybrid cross. Okay. So what the dihybrid cross actually showed is that each pair of alleles, so each character will segregate independently from one another in gamete formation. This is how um, you remember in meiosis, how the homologous chromosomes can line up independently uh, along the metaphase plate. It could be like all blue, all red, or it could be flocked. That's the independent assortment we're talking about. So those alleles can independently assort regardless of what allele is being passed on for the other character. So for example, just because the round 
allele is getting passed on doesn't mean that the yellow allele has to go with it. It could either get yellow or green. Okay. So that's what the independent assortment is in terms of um, inheritance to the next generation. We can also see independent assortment in, uh, for example, Labrador retrievers. So here we have two characters. We have uh, vision and coat color. So black and normal vision are your dominant characters or your dominant traits. Blind and brown coat color are your recessive traits, okay? So if you have um, a pure breeding uh, parents and you breed those with um, each other, you end up with heterozygous F1 offspring and then you breed those heterozygous offspring together, you get nine that have black coats, normal vision, three that have black coats and are blind, three that have brown coats and normal vision, and one that has a brown coat and is blind. Okay, and basically you get um, this uh, dihybrid phenotypic ratio. Okay, that nine to three to three to one ratio. And remember that ratio is specifically for dihybrid crosses. Your phenotypic ratio for monohybrid crosses is your um, three to one ratio, okay? We could also look at this figure and we could say, what is the ratio of black coats to chocolate coats in the labs? So black coats is nine, 10, 11, 12 to four. So 12 to four, okay? And then blind is uh, to normal is the same thing. Nine normal, three normal, so 12, three to one, four, or three and one is four, so 12 to four. That is also a three to one ratio for each of those individual um, individual phenotypes. And the reason why I am bringing that up is because remember we said that a dihybrid cross is also the same thing as two monohybrid crosses. And let me just see if I have that in here. Okay, so I'll go ahead and, and, and show you this real quick. All right, so for example, what we can do is, let's say we wanna do two crosses. We wanna do coat color and we wanna do vision, right? And we're doing the F2 generation. So that means our F1 generation are heterozygous individuals. So they would be two heterozygous for coat color. And two heterozygous for vision. Okay, so now if we filled these out, you would get your resulting genotypes. Right. And then for vision, Okay, and so if we do our phenotypic ratios, how many are black? One, two, three that have the dominant, so three. How many are brown? One. Then we have how many are normal vision? We have three. Okay, and then how many are blind? You have one. And then what we can do is we can take our numbers and we can multiply them together to determine our um, 
our dihybrid phenotypic ratios. So how many individuals would we have that have a black coat and normal vision? So three times three, because three have black, three have normal, so three times three is nine. Okay, how many have black coats and are blind? So that would be three for black, one for blind, so that's three times one is three. How many are chocolate coat and normal vision? So chocolate coat is one, normal vision is three, so three times one is three. And then how many are um, chocolate coat and blind? So one for chocolate coat, one for blind, one times one is one. So our two monohybrid crosses gave us our phenotypic ratios of our dihybrid cross, because again, Dihybrid cross is pretty much the same thing as, as the product of two monohybrid crosses. Okay, so just kind of an easier, quicker way to look at your, your dihybrid crosses uh, or a way to look at the outcome of two characters without having to draw that 16 square monohybrid cross, or, or I'm sorry, 16 square dihybrid cross. Okay. All right. <clears throat> And so that's our basic intro to um, genetics with kind of uh, building an understanding of monohybrid crosses, dihybrid crosses, what are our alleles, what are our genotypes versus our phenotypes, and what are the ratios for those different crosses, and kind of how Gregor Mendel went about determining these specific um, inheritance patterns. What we'll do with the next two videos is we'll get an idea of kind of the differences for, um, or I should say exceptions to these inheritance patterns. And then we'll finish up with kind of disorders that you can see occur in um, these inheritance patterns as well. And so we'll see you in the next video.